Robinson and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. Well, I've been trying to put this day off for a while, but I think it's time to start the wing. So what I've done is I've laminated the W4s and 4As and the 5 and the 5A together, ready. I've got some basswood spars um, ready to go. These are longer than, than normal. I've also glued on the ply sort of spar, I don't know what you call it, web. He calls it a ply spar web. So that's ready to go. So that goes in there. So I think it might be time to get cracking. Um, I've also, where you can see that, I've used my routing trick with the sanding block in a pillar drill, and then I've moved this around to route out that section, and that's for the hinge. It's quite difficult to do later on once the wing is built, so we'll, we'll do it now. So really, it's just a case of laying all the ribs out, and uh, and we'll see how we go. I'm going to use tight bond ultimate for this uh, and we'll just have to see how we go. So as you can see, I've just dry fitted all the ribs. This is the first step. I've also dry fitted the wing joining tube and it slid through the holes really nicely. So that's, uh, so that's good. So there was no real force involved. Um, I won't fit the tube yet, but I just wanted to make sure it was, it was a good fit. Um, it's going to be quite difficult to align everything because there's, the, the ribs are not exactly where they should be on the plan. The distance between six and seven is about a quarter of an inch out um, and the distance between four and five is out and three and four are out so 
they're not it's not quite been cut to the plan um, and I'm not absolutely certain the fronts are going to match either but um, it should be about there it might be all right we'll have to see but I think it's going to be a little bit harder than I thought you can't just pin the ribs down the way you would with a smaller model and make sure they're upright on the spars and stuff like that the leading hedge the leading leading hedge the leading edge almost needs making now as well so um, I'm just scratching around now to see if I can um, uh, do the leading edge at the same time to try and keep everything true um, I may also run in the rear spar just dry just to give me something else to to align it to um, it's actually very tempting to just um, wick in some thin CA into all of these joints it's not you know I had hoped to use the um, the tight bond but it's going to be quite difficult I think to um, to make that happen the rear spar is actually lining up quite nicely and and might be good for holding the, the rear sections together um, the issue is is where the thin zap will work with the basswood um, I need to use a, a glue that soaks in uh, but will soak into the to the back to, to this wood as well what I might try is is some some thin CA and uh, actually the spar gets chamfered down there so that's why it's proud um, I might try some thin CA in all the joints and then go over them as well with, with tight bonds.
Okay, a bit of an update on where I'm at at the end of day one on the wing. So you can see, uh, it's, it's pretty well framed out. Uh, you saw me put the ribs in and the lower and upper spars and what have you. But you can see now everything is, is glued a little bit more solidly. The leading edge is in. The um, spar webbing, the balsa spar webbing is in. It's uh, eighth for the first three bays and 332 further out, right the way to the tip. If anybody's looking at doing a model similar to this and it's using basswood spars, check the thickness of your spars at the tip and before you actually use them, plane them to, to the right thickness because the, um, they actually get down to about an eighth of an inch rather than quarter and to plane them in situ is really, really difficult and you end up damaging the balsa of ribs that are surrounding it. Uh, not good, especially the rear spars, which are, if I come around this side, you can see how thin they are and how they've had to taper from quarter and I'm still not happy with the way they are, but you can see the damage it's done to the ribs. No matter how careful you are, you're trying to sand a very hard piece of wood when it's surrounded by balsa. Not good. Anyway, it's it's done, and on the when I do the other wing panel, I'll make sure I plane the 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 spars down to the right thickness at the tips before they go on the model. Um, it's become apparent that there's some issues around the drawing as well. Um, you'll see that the top of the aileron shroud, the ailerons are, well, you can see on the plan where the ailerons come to, they come to here. So you've got this huge gap and you have a shroud here that goes to here that attaches to that. So you've, you've got some, some big gaps. In fact, let me just move that back to where it should be so you can actually see in reality what's going on. So, so there's the aileron. And the shroud is here okay but you think oh well that's not so bad I'll just add sheeting from here to here well that's not what happens the sheeting is from here to here so you've got a gap now this is not so bad because you've got ribs that you can attach that piece of 1 8 to but when we come to the the flap as you can see by the drawing that's where the, um, I'll line it up so you can get a real accurate idea of how far it's got to go, get the wing on the spar. So you can see the cross-hatched section is, is wood. So there's a gap from the, from the back of the spar, trailing edge spar, to that wood. And there's nothing to support that wood. Now again, you think, oh well, I'll just bridge it over here. Well, you can't actually, because this isn't supposed to have wood on it. It's supposed to be clear. So I'm going to have to build some sort of triangular gusset at the back of this that I can then sheet. You know, I can and I can add this this shroud, this diagonally marked line. So it's taken a bit of cunning to figure that out. I also realised quite early on when I was putting the the webs on the rear spars that you have to fit the hinges for the flaps and for the ailerons so i've had to hack them open again and fit them and then i thought well i can't just glue them in they have to be aligned so you'll see that there's a length of piano wire running right through the um the glass fiber hinges just to make sure that it all stays straight and that one does go to that one at the end when you slide it along and they move nice and freely, so there, there isn't there isn't an issue with them being aligned. They're all they're all neatly aligned. Okay, so the next step is to try and build up this trailing edge to accept the shroud, and uh, and um, and that that should be interesting. I might try with the aileron shroud first, get a feel for that, and then do the flap shroud. But that's that's a job for another day. Anyway, there you go. That's end of day one on building a wing. And I've never built a, a 48 inch single part of a wing. <laughs> Can't believe this thing is 103 inch span.
you can see model as the wing is progressing but I, I have hit something that is quite interesting and I thought I'd show you it. Here we have the flap and the way that we trim the leading edge of the flap to fit perfectly inside the shroud as the flap is lowered is what you do is you you get it so that the flap will actually fit the gaps and then you 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 hinge it so it's ready to go and then you slide a bit of glass paper this is 120 and you slide it between the shroud and the surface and you sand up and down just you only put a quarter of an inch of the paper inside the gap there and you keep going up and down and up and down and you'll gradually find that the flap will go lower and lower and lower and lower and the distance between the shroud and the flap <clears throat> will be the same all the way through its movement. Now I've still got a bit to go here because I've got to hit 30%. So I've got a little bit more sliding inside there, just holding a bit of pressure on the flap and then you just go up and down. Like that. Do a bit in the front. The hinge stops me going right past it. Oops. And gradually, you'll find that you get, you know, the, the, the movement that you require and the gap between the two surfaces or between the shroud and the flap remains perfect. It's a very neat little trick and I've, I've got a long way to go, it's a bit slow, but um, you get the idea. Right, there we go. Um, I probably ought to show you the underside so you can see what's going on there. Here you can see the, um, the three hinges, hinge points. And I've just run a piece of piano wire from one end to the other. And you can see that the, the distance between the flat leading edge and the upper capping, the trailing edge capping strip is, is nice. So um, this is how it will operate. Some, some gaps to fill in and what have you, but um, all in all we're getting there. So I'll just keep working on the underside, but on the top surface until I can get the 30 degrees of flat that I require. So apologies for not showing the actual building taking place, but it, there's just too much to, to video and build at the same time. So uh, when it's a task like covering or something, then that's fine. But this sort of work that I've just done here, which is uh, sorting out the servo mounting and the aileron horn mounting, this has taken hours and hours, and you really don't want to watch me doing that while while I go along. But it probably is quite important to see how I've done it. So what I've used, uh, you can possibly see, is I've used a section of angle aluminium that is available from a hardware store, and I've just cut it with a little notch. I mean, several modelers do this. It's a very simple way to make a mount. Um, and there are actually two screws on the other side. There's only the one on this side, and, and that's adequate. That's more than enough. Uh, I've had to use a very small output disc, or not a small, but they, they do a small round output disc with these high-tech HS645s, uh, but it's well under the um, the surface of the model. Uh, I've used a, a soldered-on uh, terminator at that end, and the other end is just a threaded, threaded section that goes through. There is a very small hole or notch in the spar. It's not enough to worry about. I was actually going to lay some more ply over the top to reinforce it, but I don't think it's going to need it. I think that'll be fine there because we're at mid-span, so it's uh, it should be okay. Um, what I'll also just quickly show you while um, I'm at it is how I'm going to do the undercarriage. Now, the way that Mick Reeves does it, and I'll show you on the plan, the way he does it is he puts a quarter ply plate underneath the ribs um, and then attaches it epoxy and then he then there's a hole through the through the middle with a quarter block doubler over the top of it and then a hole through the middle um, and what he's using on here is those uh, robot robo struts you can get um, a sort of a, a square plate with a tube welder to the middle as a mounting 
and you slide the the oleo leg up into this clamp into this plate and clamp it through here um, and that locks it uh, in place it's a, it's a good way of doing it but each one of these brackets is $38 and the oleo leg itself is something like $200 and obviously you need two of each, so um, that's a bit extravagant. I can't can't stretch to that sort of sort of money. So unless I can find some second hand, I'm going to either make my own or see if I can get something from Unitracks. So as you can see from that, really you've got the ribs with the doublers and a plywood plate underneath. So the way I've done it, slightly different. In fact, quite different. <laughs> Let's turn it all around. Hopefully you can see that. I've made uh, a plywood plate and it's a very similar plate in fact I started with the the doubler plate for the spa uh, and modified it and then cut it out in quarter ply and it's sort of half notched so half the ribs and half this ply plate are notched so that this will drop down um, and I also was was fairly cunning and I'll show you a picture in a second how I blocked up the wing using the tube as my level or my reference and then drew a line vertically to give me my undercarriage angle. You'll see there's a steel tube in the middle of there, there's a thin wall steel tube and what happens is you, you put a notch across the top, you slide in your aluminium oleo leg and it has a bolt across the top um, and it fits in that notch so that um, the leg is always straight and it holds it true and straight. Um, and then there's another screw that goes in that just clamps the leg to this steel one. Uh, I haven't worked out all the wrinkles yet, but that's basically how you do it. This is this is a, a technique that Dave Wormsley used on his quarter scale chipmunk. So I'm going to to nick a bit of Dave's uh, method and use it in this Jerry Bates one. So there we go. So you can see from that quick update that the flaps are all done and hinged. I've added capping strips because it just didn't look right without. So they're all done. The shrouds are all done, the ailerons now all, all finished as well, I've put capping strips on those as well, so they're all done. Um, and that first aileron is in. It's mounted on basswood rails which are notched into the ribs, so uh, more than adequate. If we uh, look at the linkage, it's really, really good. You know, there's a little bit of slop, but that's well, it's not actually slop in the linkage. It's actually flex in the in the uh, control surface. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some some diagonals into these bays that will be below the covering uh, because it isn't it isn't the most rigid um, surface in the world. Uh, and because I'm using the control horn at this end, obviously you you've potentially got a lot of flexing that could happen at the other end. So uh, I think those little torsional riblets, diagonal riblets, will um, will make a difference. So so there we go. So the servo is not quite where Jerry had it. Jerry has it more, I think, in this bay over here. Um, and I've moved it inboard a little bit just to, to bring it into the a more scale position. This area here is all uh, can actually be cut away because there is actually a notch that runs like that. Um, for the for the actuation arm and everything so the full size hinge um, push rod comes in through here as well so um, so I'm about right I'm not sure how I'll hide all that and how I can assemble this once it's covered without um, you know without a problem but uh, but we'll see as for servo access you're all going to shout and say oh yeah you've got to make hatches and stuff because you'll never get in to to repair it replace the servo should one fail well I really haven't had servos fail. It, you know, it just doesn't happen. Um, not for me anyway, but it could. So on this particular chipmunk, it has a big patch or a big section of fabric here. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll build some framework here and then I'll cover it. Um, and if there is a disaster and I really do need to change it, then I'll simply have to cut the covering through there, replace the servo. Um, and then patch it up when I get home. But you can fly a competition once you've been through your static judging with an open section like that, you know, that, that's had to be repaired. I'd probably cover it with masking tape or something like that. But uh, but you can do that sort of thing in competition. And in fact, if it happens 
during your first flight, which can sometimes be first before you're static judged, then, you know, the, uh, the judges can take into account any damage that may have happened on your first flight and cutting that hatch open to replace a servo would be con would be classed as such an incident instance. So there we go. The wing tubes that we made all fit nicely and uh, I've had to just slightly relieve the spar at the bottom there and just give it a little bit of a radius. Um, it won't really uh, impact the strength too greatly, especially once I've reinforced all the joints around here and glued the tube in because it's it's not in at the moment. It's still still loose. So um, once once all sorts of um, colloidal silica and epoxy go in there to 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 fix that tube in place, we'll be well away. The the bolts at the back of that undercarriage mount won't be that long. Obviously, they'll be shorter and there'll be there'll be nylocks so that um, things can't move. So so there we go. I hope that's a bit of an update. So that's that's more or less, oh, I don't know, a week's work, just over a week's work to get one wing to this stage. It's very difficult to sheet the leading edge without uh, the oleo legs and all the undercarriage uh, sorted out. So I'm afraid it's just going to have to wait until, probably until I've built the other wing, but because uh, I'm, I'm still struggling on the oleo front. Okie dokes. If you've enjoyed the video, please click like and subscribe. And I'll s oh, before you go, you might want to see this. We always lack a bit of waggling, don't we? Right, see you on the next one.